Nach monatelangem Warten sind nun die ersten F-16 Kampfjets in der Ukraine angekommen. Doch schon der erste Einsatz scheint ein katastrophaler Misserfolg zu sein. Das Flugzeug wurde angeblich durch Friendly Fire, also durch Beschuss der eigenen Luftabwehr, zum Absturz gebracht. Einer der besten Piloten der Ukraine kam dabei ums Leben. Präsident Zelensky ließ daraufhin umgehend den Luftwaffenchef General Nikolai Oleschuk absetzen. Mittlerweile kursieren in den Medien auch Berichte, dass die Absturzursache doch nicht eigener Beschuss gewesen sein soll. Es ist auch die Rede von mangelhafter abgespeckter Technologie, die der Ukraine übergeben wurde. Wie schätzt du den Vorfall ein? Was führte zum Absturz der ukrainischen F-16? Well, again, as you said, there are competing narratives in the press and we're left with that, um, you know. But let's reverse engineer the problem even more. The aircraft that were provided to Ukraine were aircraft that had already ex, um, ex, were expired in terms of their operational um, viability. These are aircraft that were decades old. Uh, they'd already gone through one life extension um, maintenance period. Um, but at the end of the day, metal fatigue um, It, you know, sets in this, this airplane is not capable. The airplanes provided is not, are not capable of performing of uh, the way the F-16 is designed to perform. Uh, the aircraft was put in an air to air mode, um, basically, uh, tasked with intercepting, uh, Russian drones, Russian cruise missiles, Russian missiles, if it could find it, um, in a, um, environment where, um, you know, it, it had to integrate with Ukrainian surface to air missile capabilities. Um, this plane was not up to the mission. The pilot wasn't up to the mission. He may have been Ukraine's best pilot, but he's not a good F-16 pilot. He barely knows how to take the airplane off, how to land it, and how to do rudimentary uh, maneuvers with it. Now he's thrown into a uh, intense combat situation where he will fall back on his prior training as maybe a MiG-29 or an Su-27 uh, pilot. And he um, will probably try to put the airplane into a maneuver that the airframe couldn't support. And, um, and then there was probably a massive um, structural failure on the aircraft. It disintegrated in flight and he died. Uh, that's, that's my guess. I don't have proof of this, but that, you know, If he wasn't brought down by friendly fire and the Russians didn't bring him down, um, then he was brought down by a failure in the equipment. And uh, the most likely failure in the equipment is the aircraft itself, which, um, you know, the reason why Ukraine is flying it is because NATO can no longer fly it. <laughs> it's a plane that NATO has said, we can't fly this anymore. It's too old. It's too dangerous. NATO would never allow its pilots to carry out maneuvers that have a high G load, high stress factor on the, on the airframe. And yet they gave it to Ukraine and now a Ukrainian pilot is dead because he thought the airplane could do what it clearly can't. Das Wall Street Journal berichtete jüngst unter Berufung auf anonyme Insider, dass die beiden Regierungen einen Plan des US-Verteidigungsministeriums abgelehnt habe, wonach US-Militärangehörige für die Ukraine die Wartung von westlicher Waffentechnik übernehmen sollte, darunter auch die F-16-Kampfjets. Dem Bericht nach war die Angelegenheit dem Weißen Haus zu riskant. Stattdessen sollen nun die europäischen NATO-Mitglieder für die Wartung der F-16 zuständig werden. Was heißt das genau? Ist an den ukrainischen Flugfeldern NATO-Personal stationiert, das die Wartung und Ausstattung der Kampfjets übernimmt? Warum kann das die Ukraine nicht selbst machen? Und warum weigern sich die USA, das zu tun? Die F-16 ist ein komplizierter Airframe. Um, it becomes more complicated as it grows older, because the maintenance requirements are, uh, are quite high. I think uh, the ratio for maintenance per flight hour is 17 hours of maintenance for one hour of flight time. Um, so if you're sortie, that you're going to fly uh, with an F-16 is a three-hour sortie. That means you take off three hours later, you land. Um, you know, I'm not a, a great math expert, but that's 51 hours of maintenance. Um, that's a lot of maintenance. And in a combat situation where airplanes could be called upon to fly multi, multiple sorties per day um, uh, for an extended period of time, um, it's a 
it's an unsustainable uh, maintenance burden. Um, to maintain an aircraft, you have to be intimately familiar with the aircraft, um, especially an aircraft as old as these. Um, you have to have the ability to constantly x-ray the airframe to look for hairline fractures because uh, the metal has become brittle over time. Um, every time the plane is thrown uh, is flown in a um, high G load, um, you know, profile, um, it, it, the plane has to be evaluated because the plane is being stressed. Um, you have to see if the plane, you know, can, can continue to fly. Uh, the engine has to be maintained properly. Uh, the electronics, the avionics, everything has to be maintained. Um, it requires uh, a mechanic, it, it, you know, just because I can change out a spark plug um, and change the oil and, uh, and, 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 and maybe change an air filter in my car doesn't mean that I'm a BMW mechanic. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, to be a BMW mechanic, you have to be intimately familiar with the BMW. You have to have the equipment, uh, especially new BMWs with all the electronics. You have to have the special, um, you know, analytical equipment that plugs into the BMW. And you, know, you have to know how to, how to read it, what it means, et cetera, and then how, you know, how to act. Uh, extensive training is required. The Ukrainian pilots aren't the only ones who have no training. They don't know how to fly the F-16, um, not to its full capacity, not in a combat environment. Uh, but the Ukrainian maintainers don't know how to maintain this aircraft either. Um, you know, they, they can start it, they can shut it down, they can refuel it, and um, they can load weapons on it. That's about it. Uh, after that, the plane has to be turned over to people who are trained. There wasn't enough time to train the pilots and there wasn't enough time to train the maintenance personnel. Um, so the, the F-16 will shoot itself down uh, in less than a week. If you fly the F-16 without adequate maintenance, it will shoot itself down. It will fall apart in the sky. Witness the first F-16. Um, so the plane has to be taken to maintenance. You have to have qualified people to maintain it. Now, you can do this in Ukraine, but the Ukrainians don't have the personnel, which means now that you'd have to put Western personnel on the ground in Ukraine, knowing that the F-16 is the most hunted uh, weapon system in Ukraine, that the Russians are scouring all the airfields looking for where the F-16 is and striking these airfields, um, which means that whatever personnel you put on the ground, there's a high risk they're going to be killed. And NATO doesn't want to be seen as an active participant in this conflict. So it's very unlikely that uh, the maintainers are on the ground, which means now they're going to be back at a uh, airfield in Poland or Romania, which means that the F-16, once it flies its combat missions, will flee back to Poland, back to Romania, to NATO airfields, where it will be maintained by NATO personnel. But at some point in time, Russia will have every right to say that these airfields now have become an extension of the battlefield because they're providing direct support to Ukrainian weapon systems uh, that are being used to, to fight Russia, which means these airfields can be struck. So any personnel on the ground in these airfields will be killed, too. Um, this is why the F-16 should never have been provided to Ukraine, because it's an unsustainable concept. Um, it, all it does is escalate the conflict dangerously towards a direct confrontation between Russia and NATO. And it provides Ukraine with no combat capability, none whatsoever. There's not a single mission that the F-16 is performing that can't be better handled by MiG-29s or SU-27s that the Ukrainians know how to fly and know how to maintain. The, 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 the amount of money wasted in, in this whole F-16 propaganda exercise um, could have bought, you know, dozens of uh, MiG-29s and SU-27s um, that would have, you know, helped Ukraine. If you take a look, you know, Ukraine has successfully bombed bridges in Kursk using MiG-29s adapted to carry French and American bombs. Um, MiG-29s and SU-27s carrying Western weapons are carrying out strikes, successful strikes. That's the system. That's what Ukraine should be getting. If you want to help Ukraine, flood Ukraine with MiG-29s, flood them with SU-27s. Um, but instead, they chose to give them the F-16s because it's propaganda. But the F-16 has zero military capability. It weakens Ukraine. 
And for that, the Russians should be thankful. The West wasted all this time and effort on giving Ukraine a weapon system that kills itself. Laut Medienberichten hat vergangene Woche ein Geheimtreffen der NATO unter Teilnahme der Ukraine in Dresden stattgefunden. Unter strenger Geheimhaltung und Antispionagemaßnahmen soll dabei ein neuartiges Produkt des deutschen Rüstungskonzerns Rheinmetall vorgestellt worden sein. Eine neue Version des Skyranger Luftabwehrsystems. Rheinmetall erweitert gerade massiv seine Produktionskapazitäten und plant unter anderem ein neues Rüstungswerk in Niedersachsen. Wir haben dazu zwei Fragen. Erstens. Worum ging es tatsächlich bei dem Geheimtreffen? Nur um die Präsentation eines modifizierten Luftabwehrsystems? Zweitens, wie schätzt du das Skyranger Luftabwehrsystem ein? Taugt das für den Einsatz in der modernen Kriegsführung? Well, first of all, if it's a secret meeting, I don't know anything about it. And I don't know what they discussed, I don't know anything. So I, I can't even begin to answer that question. Um, if it is as you outlined, uh, the participants are as you allege, then one can infer that it deals with um, how Germany uh, can provide additional military assistance to Ukraine using um, you know, Rheinmetall's production capacity. Um, and one can infer that because of Ukraine's need for air defense, that uh, this, the Sky Ranger system was the system discussed. But I don't know. It was a secret meeting. Um, so, you know, who knows, uh, any weapon system, if it's upgraded sufficiently might have application on the modern battlefield. Sometimes in fact, uh, given the, um, the, you know, overwhelming role played by electronic warfare, uh, the more modern the system is, the more susceptible it is to being, um, impeded by electronic warfare, maybe an older system, um, you know, might be able to have a higher degree of efficiency and survivability. I don't know. I don't know what modifications are being suggested by Ryan Mattel. Um, that's probably secret too. And, um, you know, so I don't know, it's a lot of speculation involved in this. Um, the one thing though, that I can say is who's going to pay for this because it's not going to be Germany, which is why I think the meeting was held in the United States because Germany is bankrupt. Germany has already said they can't afford to continue to support Ukraine on the level that they had. The German military is shrinking, not growing. The German budget uh, can't sustain these grand plans. Uh, the German economy is in crisis. Uh, that crisis will have to be dealt with by politicians who simply can't print money. Um, and I think you're seeing, based upon uh, election results, there's a growing uh, sentiment inside Germany that this war in Ukraine is wrong, uh, that The German economy is being damaged by sanctions that limit German Germany's access to Russian energy, and that uh, in the long term Germany would be better off having good relations with Russia, not bad relations with Russia. All of this new political reality um, argues against, um, you know, whatever grand plan Rheinmetall has to enrich its shareholders, because that's all this is about. It's about Rheinmetall uh, making money um, at the expense of the Ukrainian people. Um, so I think what you're seeing here is that uh, the Germans are looking to the United States to underwrite um, German defense industry because the German budget can no longer sustain these, these operations. And whether the American public is going to go along with this is yet to be seen. Um, you know, there is a big election coming up in November. And one of the issues that uh, is being discussed is the, the war in Ukraine and uh, whether or not the United States should continue to support Ukraine along the levels that it, it currently is. Wie schätzt du generell die deutschen Rüstungskapazitäten ein? Verfügt Deutschland über gut entwickelte und moderne Waffensysteme? Sollte sich Deutschland unabhängiger von den USA und ihrer Rüstungsproduktion machen? I don't think Germany is alone in um, losing sight of the reality of war when it develops weapon systems. Um, you know, Germany hasn't fought a, uh, or hasn't prepared to fight a major ground war since the end of the Cold War. Um, since that time, the German military, like the rest of NATO, has gone through uh, resizing, restructuring, and, um, and, and also has lost the... Um, 
the stature it once had in terms of how society views it. And as a result, um, they, the defense industries, when you are looking at reduced structures, put an emphasis on technology over uh, functionality. Um, and I think Germany is as guilty of this as anybody else, producing um, weapon systems that are designed to provide a technological advantage um, over any potential enemy. Um, but the Ukraine conflict has shown that um, in sustained high-intensity conflict, uh, what you need is reliability and functionality. Um, you need equipment that can be easily maintained. Um, you need equipment that's going to work in all weather conditions, uh, even if denied uh, maintenance. Um, it, German equipment doesn't meet that. Neither does, the, neither does the United States, France, or anything else. The German defense industry has been producing very expensive equipment that has zero survivability on the modern battlefield. Look at the Leopard tank. It's burning like a candle everywhere it goes in, in Ukraine and curse. Look at the Martyr infantry fighting vehicle. Look at any equipment that Germany has provided. Um, it's difficult to maintain, almost impossible to maintain, and it has a, a very low survivability rate in combat. Um, so I, I think that the German weapons, like Western weapons in general, um, are not built for this high intensity modern warfare that we're seeing in Ukraine. And that, uh, the problem is how does Germany transition to that? Because again, companies like Rheinmetall, uh, they make their money off of producing, you know, high technology junk. They don't make their money off of producing low technology weapon systems. Uh, that the need. And the other thing too is when you go to the low technology weapon system, you're acknowledging that there's going to be casualties. See, the whole idea of the high technology, the technological supremacy is to say with this technology, we shall protect the men inside or men and women inside this, this vehicle. You can't protect anybody in war. <laughs> They're going to die in large numbers. That's just the reality of it. What you need to make sure is that you have enough equipment and enough manpower to um, continue to work through this high casualty rate. So it's better off to produce more equipment that's less technologically advanced than to produce less equipment that's extremely technologically advanced because the, the stream, extremely technologically advanced equipment was designed in peacetime parameters with the theory of war that wasn't really fully developed. The equipment is not survivable on the modern battlefield. It's too expensive. You can't produce enough of it. And it doesn't shield the men and women inside from harm. Um, the German defense industry has failed, the German military and the German people. But they only did it because the German government went along with the game. And the German people um, basically remained silent while this was happening, trusting their elected officials and their so-called military experts to do what's right by them. All they did is waste a whole bunch of German money. Die Schweiz ist bekannt für ihre jahrhundertealte Neutralität in der internationalen Politik. In zahlreichen Kriegen fungierte sie als Bankier für alle Seiten der Konflikte. Nun werden Stimmen in der Schweiz laut, dass die Neutralitätspolitik der Schweiz neu definiert werden müsse. Eine Expertengruppe fordert, dass sich die Schweiz stärker mit der NATO und der EU verbinden solle, um so die gemeinsamen Verteidigungskapazitäten zu erhöhen – gegen Russland. Die Pläne stoßen in der schweizerischen Opposition auf starke Ablehnung. Die Schweizerische Volkspartei sieht darin einen Versuch, mit der Neutralität auch die Souveränität der Schweiz auszuhebeln. Was sagst du zu diesem Vorhaben? Warum gieren NATO und EU darauf, die Schweiz in ihr Netz einzuspannen? First of all, I think it's important for the United States and NATO and the European Union to eliminate the concept of neutrality. We've seen them successfully do that with Finland and Sweden, um, two neutral states which have yielded to the pressure placed on them by the United States, NATO, and the European Union to join NATO. Um, a, a neutral Switzerland uh, puts Europe in a quandary. Because if Switzerland is truly neutral, that means it can get along with the West and it can get along with Russia on equal terms. Um, 
this does not conform to the good versus evil, black versus white uh, picture that uh, the United States, NATO, and the European Union are trying to paint. And so they're placing a lot of pressure on Switzerland to forego uh, its traditional neutrality and uh, come over to the West. Um, but there's a lot of Swiss people that uh, take umbrage at this. And so I guess they passed a petition um, that received the a requisite number of signatures in Switzerland that will now take the issue of Swiss neutrality to a national referendum. This is a unique aspect of uh, Swiss democracy. Um, and, um, you know, this has a good chance of passing if, if the referendum goes through. But you're going to see between now and the referendum, uh, Switzerland will be placed under a tremendous amount of pressure to, um, to, decisively violate its neutrality so that by the time the issue comes to a vote in a referendum, uh, Switzerland would already have um, foregone its neutral status and come over decisively to the West, making it almost impossible uh, to go back. So you're going to see Switzerland pl placed under a lot of pressure between now and the referendum by the West, because neutrality is a concept that the, that the United States, the European Union, uh, NATO can't accept because, after all, Russia is looking to make Ukraine neutral, and uh, that flies in the face of uh, the NATO concept of uh, you know anybody should be allowed to join NATO if they want to. Well, except Russia because Russia asked a while ago and they were told no. But uh, anybody but Russia should be allowed to join NATO if they want to, except maybe China because hey, you can't have China. Anybody, uh, you see what I'm saying? <laughs>